Well, good evening. It's Sunday night, August the 2nd, 2020, and uh, we have just concluded a very lengthy Sunday night series called You Asked For It, where we tried to answer questions that our church family had submitted and had a lot of good conversations because of that and several rather lengthy discussions, a lot of good uh, fun researching and trying to help our people answer those questions. And tonight I want to begin a new series and I'm uh, kind of titling it uh, Building Blocks for a Christian Life or Developing Your Own Christian Worldview or Figuring Out How to Grow in Christ. And very honestly, there was a time when pastors taught this type of series and they would just begin at Genesis 1-1 or they would start and say, well, this is the Bible and it says this. And, and I want to kind of back up two or three steps because I think it's important that we lay a little different foundation, perhaps. Today, I believe we must start with uh, some background basics so we define our presuppositions and are certain that we've laid and poured the proper foundation to build a life upon. So first, I want to establish the basis for our beliefs. And in doing that, I think it's important that we understand that we need to develop a Christian worldview. Now, worldview is an important word in our culture for the last 15, 20 years, specifically in Christian circles. Uh, a lot of worldview classes being offered at our schools and seminaries. A lot of teaching and a lot of references to your worldview. It uh, developed itself coming out of a, a German school of thought that talked about the importance of seeing the world. And we do need to have a particular pair of glasses on when we look at the world if we're to be a Bible-believing Christian. The Bible answers every question we need on these topics. We just need to be clear and consistent. The worldview is, uh, if I could read this definition to you, a worldview is a framework from which we view reality and make sense of life in the world. It is any ideology, philosophy, theology, movement, or religion that provides an overarching approach to understanding God, the world, and man's relationships to God and the world. Now, your personal worldview is a combination of all you believe to be true, and what you believe becomes the driving force behind every emotion, every decision, every action, every reaction. Therefore, it affects your response in every area of life, from philosophy to science, from theology to anthropology to economics to law to politics to the arts to social media to society in general. Everything is affected by your personal worldview. So as a born-again believer, you'd want to make certain that your worldview is biblical. We would base a biblical worldview on the authority and the infallibility of the Word of God. You see, when you believe the Bible to be entirely true, then you allow it to be the foundation upon which you build everything else. It is the foundation for your actions, your reactions, for your political positions, for your position relative to art and economy and all the disciplines of life. If you see it through that framework. Several years ago, George Barna surveyed people who claimed to be born again and asked them to define their worldview, and he began by asking a series of questions. And I want to ask you these questions. They're yes or no questions. Barna asked uh, these questions. Number one, do absolute moral truths exist? Yes or no? Is absolute truth defined by the Bible? Yes or no? Did Jesus Christ live a sinless life? Yes or no? Now, that was very recently discussed by a, a news commentator, wasn't it? Raised the ire of a lot of people. But did Jesus live a sinless life? Yes or no? That shapes your worldview. Number four, is God the all-powerful and all-knowing creator of the universe, and does he still rule it today? Yes or no? Is salvation a gift from God that cannot be earned? Yes or no? Is Satan real? Yes or no? Does a Christian have a responsibility to share his or her faith in Christ with other people? Yes or no? And finally, is the Bible accurate in all of its teachings? Yes or no? Now, Barna surveyed people who identified as being born-again believers. And when he asked those questions, those yes or no questions, to a great surprise to many, only 9% of these born-again believers indicated that yes was the answer to every one of those questions. 
Can I tell you something tonight? We remind ourselves that we're sinners in need of a Savior and that our fallen nature sometimes dissuades us from doing things we wish we would do. But friend, I want to challenge you to make sure you answer yes to these questions. Do absolute moral truths exist? Yes, they do. Is absolute truth defined by the Bible? Yes, it is. Did Jesus Christ live a sinless life? Yes, he did. Is God the all-powerful and all-knowing creator of all the universe, and does he still rule it today? Yes, he does. Is salvation a gift from God that cannot be earned? Yes, it is. Is Satan real? Yes, he is. Does a Christian have the responsibility to share his or her faith in Christ with other people? Absolutely, yes, he does. And is the Bible accurate in all of its teaching? Yes, it is. Now, friend, I want you to understand that when we look to establish a worldview, we must understand our source of authority. Now, everyone has a worldview. And just like everyone has a worldview, everyone has an ultimate sense of authority in their lives. That authority, whatever it is, will shape your worldview and influence your decision making. There are several options when it comes to authority sources for us. Option number one is reason. You know, there's a lot of people in our world today that think they're just about the smartest thing ever and that they can, by reason, figure everything out. I do what I do because I think or I feel this is right. I gather the data, I examine the data, I analyze the data, I discover uh, my conclusion, and based on my reason, my intellect, I then act. And there are a lot of people whose final authority is their experience. I do what I do because I feel it is right. And I feel good when I do this or when I think about doing this. It seems to have good and desirable results. It's, it's kind of the expression of the pleasure principle that gets applied to life. My experience helps me to say that this is the right thing to do. What is your ultimate source of authority? Is it reason? Is it experience? Maybe for you it's tradition. I do what I do because this is the way it's always been done. Uh, my parents taught me this, and my mom was always right. My dad was always right. My grandma told me the way it should be. You heard the story about the a woman who was teaching her daughter how to cook, and she said, when you get a pot roast, you cut off this end, you cut off that end, and you put it in the pan. And she says, well, Mom, why do we cut the ends off the pot roast? And she says, well, that's the way my mother taught me. So she called her grandma and said, Grandma, why do we cut the ends off the pot roast? And she goes, that's the way my mother taught me. So she drove to the nursing home and got with her great-grandma and said, Great-grandma, i got to know, why do you cut the ends off the pot roast before you make the pot roast? And she said, Honey, back in the day I had a really small pan. All right. We have traditions that, that may or may not make any sense to us today, but people are dead set and rigid about their traditions. What they were taught by someone or what they believe is a reasonable tradition that should be followed today. There's another source of authority, and very honestly, it's peer pressure. Now, we tend to talk about this in relative to our students, our teenagers, but there's an awful lot of adults who struggle from peer pressure, aren't there? I do what I do because others are doing it. I'm a part of a particular group, and acceptance in that group is desirable, so in order to receive their approval, I do what I think they will like. I do what they do, kind of the herd mentality, if you would, so that I'm a part of the group because being in that group is absolutely important to me, and the final authority for my life hinges on acceptance by these people. And then ultimately, there's a group of people, and I think this is probably the best one. I'll just tell you my bias. The absolute source of authority is revelation. I do what I do. I think the way I think. I live the way I live because God says so. I've strived to immerse myself in the Word of God to know what it says. It's become my guide and my compass for life. I, I know that I have a fallen mind and a deceitful heart. I have shallow feelings. I have pressure from others. But I choose to place myself under the authority of the Word of God. I choose to place myself under the revealed Word of God made clear to us through Jesus. My source of authority for my worldview is your final authority reason, experience, tradition, peer pressure, or the revelation of God. But you know, in order to better understand really our worldview, not only we need to understand what our authority is, but we need to understand what we think about God. Scholars tell us there are about seven possible positions 
that help mold our worldview when it comes to what we think about God. Now, the first theistic view would be atheism. Uh, no God exists beyond what we can think, and uh, no God exists in the universe. There's no God out there. There's no God in here. And uh, Marxism, uh, Buddhism, secular humanism, all those things teach this practice. And, and agnosticism would be a soft form of this, if you would, professing that there could be no knowledge of God. So atheism is one way we look at the world and develop a, a worldview. There's a second one. It's polytheism, which is the idea that there are many gods in the universe. Uh, examples certainly would be the ancient world. Uh, when I was pastoring in Claremont County, Ohio, Milford, Ohio, uh, somewhere over towards the Eastgate area, they were building a uh, Buddhist temple. And I was invited to go over there, and I toured the temple with one of their uh, temple leaders. And I took my shoes off when I walked in, and we walked over to a rock. He said, this is a god. We walked over to another rock. He said, this is another god. And then he told us that, that, that they were getting ready to um, consecrate their larger sanctuary when it would be completed, and they would bring in bigger rocks because they were bigger gods. That's the idea of polytheism, that there are many gods. We see this in Shintoism. We see it in Mormonism. A polytheistic worldview uh, states that as man now is, God once was. As God now is, man may become. That's, that's, the, that's the heart and soul of Mormonism. The idea that you can become gods. There are multiple gods. And very honestly, that lends itself to idolatry, where you pick a favorite god. Polytheism is a second theistic view. Pantheism would be the third view that God is the universe, and God is equal to all that there is, and all that there is is equal to God, kind of the Hindu, the, the Zen Buddhist issue, the Christian science, of many of the New Agers. You know, they don't want to step on an ant because that's part of God. All things together, pantheistic. Pan means all, all theism. And then there's something similar to that called panentheism, the idea that God is in the universe. God is kind of the director of the world. The world is the same as God's body. God cooperates with us. God is interdependent with the world. He is, he is finite. He is temporal. He is always changing. He is constantly being perfected. Uh, a lot of liberal philosophers, uh, Whitehead, um, uh, Ogden, a lot of people attribute this type of philosophy to the, the Star Wars movies. Now, for the record, I know the Star Wars movies are fantasy. It's science fiction. It's not real. But the teachings and the theology that they evoke uh, is this kind of panentheism that the world and God is constantly changing. Uh, some extreme liberal views in Judaism also kind of adhere to this idea that God is in the universe. He's the executive director. He's the CEO, uh, but he's not uh, infinite. He's not all-powerful. Then there's a finite theism, the idea that a finite God exists somewhere beyond and somewhere in the universe, but he's actually beyond the universe. But he acts within the universe. And I think uh, Plato, um, I think uh, Rabbi uh, Harold Kushner, who wrote the book, uh, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, would argue this position. Uh, Christian thinkers like Clark Pinnock, uh, Greg Boyd argue this idea that a finite God exists beyond and in the universe, and he actually becomes the universe or beyond the universe but he acts within it, but he only acts in very limited ways. And then there's just simple deism, that God exists beyond the universe, but not supernaturally. That God exists totally transcendent somewhere else. He created the universe, but he doesn't care about it, nor does he intervene. There's no reason to pray for him. There's no reason to pray to him because he just doesn't care. And then there's theism, which would be our belief that there is a personal, infinite God who is beyond the universe but also acts within it. This worldview provides a balance between the idea of the transient God who's way out yonder and the eminence of God who can work within us. I would challenge you to understand that even though there are multiple people who claim to be monotheistic or the belief in one God, now Judaism holds to that, Islam holds to that, but Islam doesn't have a personal God. Islam's, there is one God but Allah, but you can't know Him. You can't have a relationship with Him. 
Christianity presents a singular God. The Lord our God is one Lord, the Shema of Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. We see theism, that God is infinite and all-powerful, but the good news for us in Christian circles is He's a God you can know. And we're going to stop here tonight, but I want to challenge you to make sure that you know God. Understanding the different worldviews is extremely important, and we're going to continue in our thoughts about this. But I want you to understand that the personal God, the creator of all that is, loves you, and he loves me. And my worldview hinges on the fact that Jesus loves me so much, he gave himself for me. And I surrender myself fresh daily to the absolute lordship of Jesus Christ and the authority of the word of God for all things I strive to live and believe and practice. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for time together tonight. And help us as we continue to walk through the idea of building a life that matters for you and understanding our worldview. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, should you have questions about Jesus or about our church, please go to our website, fbc-sellersburg.org. There's a link there to the gospel. If you don't know Jesus, we'd love to hear that you've come to know Christ. If you have questions about that, we'd love to help you. Reach out to us by email or by phone. We'd love to talk with you and help you any way we can around the Word of God. May God richly bless you.